Welcome, Shane. Thank you very much. So, the last time I spoke at a free software conference in Sweden, in, in Gothenburg, was about 13, 14, maybe 15 years ago when uh, Henrik Sandcliffe in, invited me to come here. And I've had a chance to enjoy your beautiful city. Uh, I was stunned by the environment you live in. It's incredible, incredible, but too cold. Uh, I live in southwest Japan. I used to be from Ireland, but clearly I've changed. And I arrived here and it was sunny, and Henrik and other people were like, isn't it wonderful? And I was like, winter cold. <laughs> but it is still a delight to be here. And I'm going to give us a little bit of a talk today that will either be slightly interesting or not interesting at all. Officially, if I can move on one slide, uh, officially this talk is about how Linux Foundation standards will fix your supply chain. But as I continue, you'll see why it's really sort of a tiny guide to doing something that might contribute something to something else. You see, last night I was, I was thinking to myself, I was thinking to myself, what if this was it? This was the last time I would ever speak about open source. Um, you know, what, what would I say? And uh, that made me very thoughtful. Uh, and I, I came to the conclusion that I would want to talk about what I think is real and what is important. You know, open source has done well. It has done really well. It powers almost all digital technology. And incredibly, digital technology powers modern society. That's, that's amazing. And in theory, everyone can be a part of this, this emerging, wonderful potential. But not everything is about technology, not even remotely. And open source has not solved society. Technology has not solved society. It has made some things better. And it has made some things worse. One thing that worries me is that engineers like engineering things. And that solves a lot of functional challenges around the world. Functional challenges are things like bridges or buildings or spreadsheets, items governed by logic and structure. But engineers are not political scientists. And human society is not a subroutine. So perhaps, you know, perhaps, we forget that too often. We're stuck in technology utopia, overestimating ourselves and our field. Now, open source has done some stunning things. And we can manage it really well now. That means that even more stunning things will happen in the future. But most of those things, they might be stunning, but they are about products and services. Some of them are commercial products. Some of them are non-commercial services. But there are plenty of other things we need to solve. We need to solve challenges around access, equality, opportunity, and these are not functional problems. They will not be solved by licenses. They will not be solved by software. They will be solved by legislation, which is a fancy way of saying people coming to an agreement. Now we can build on what we've learned, 
both as engineering type people and as societies. That's not really 40 years of free software, and it's not 75 years of software. The wealth we have to build on is 10,000 years of recorded human history. So, overall, I do encourage you to be optimistic, but I encourage you to be realistic. I encourage you to be thoughtful about these things, and don't allow dogma to blind you. I personally think we should always try to make things better. Now, in open source, that means processes. Making things better takes better processes. In society, it also means processes, uh, but, but different processes. In all cases, it means doing our best, whatever we're doing. Now, sometimes it's relatively easy. In this talk, we'll be talking about open chain, which is about processes for open source, and quite frankly, that's relatively easy. Uh, sometimes it's hard, like human potential. That is a challenge we're still trying to understand. Now, we waste a lot of time arguing a lot of time and a lot of energy. And quite frankly, some of what we've done, our technology has harmed people. But what is the alternative? You know, do we have societies that are stagnant and static where we don't argue, we don't push forward in areas like technology? I don't think so. We in this room know that things can be better. And the reason we're here is to make things better. We're motivated in that way. So, in, in a broad sense, I think it's important that we keep focused, we get things done, and we aim to go and change the world for the better. In our tiny part, what we do is not going to change the course of human civilization. It's not going to solve hunger, hopelessness, or people having a bad day. But we can do something, and that's not bad. So the how in, in this talk, the how can we do something tiny with caveats, uh, is focused not on new stuff. New stuff is nice, I like new stuff, uh, but optimization is actually the key to value. So optimizing things is how you go from could be great into actually does good. Connecting potential and reality. And thinking about it, that's one of the things that has bothered me the most in the last 17 or 18 years. We keep talking about potential as if it's real. We don't spend enough time on the details. Now, I want to talk about one tiny optimization today in our tiny part of the field. Some of you will be aware of this, in which case now you can tune out and play with TikTok. But for those of you who aren't aware of this, here we go. In our area of open source, in terms of going and bringing things to the market, things are getting very complex. Now Simon touched on a couple of these things yesterday when he talked about various acts and directives. For example, you know, the NTIA uh, setting minimal guidelines on SBOM, the White House executive order in the US, the Cyber Resiliency Act in the European Union. I'm not dogmatic in that I think everything contains some good stuff and everything has points we can argue on. I'm not actually interested in arguing whether something is good or bad per se. I'm interested in the fact that it exists. These rules and guidelines exist. If they're not finished, we can influence them. If they're finished, we have to implement them. And they're all here for a good reason. Like the Cyber Resiliency Act notes that one of the reasons it exists is because cybercrime costs 5.5 trillion per year. We have to do something about that, and we have to do it quickly. 
Now, one reason that more rules and guidelines are appearing is because we have an interconnected and complex world, and we think that it's pretty organized. You know, we think the supply chain looks tidy and neat, and it doesn't. <laughs> the data about our supply chain is very, very concerning. So 67.4% of managers are managing their supply chain in Excel. Partly as a result of this, and partly as a result of other factors, 94% of companies don't actually know how their supply chain works. I mean, they know that something comes out of it, they just don't really know how. Which is normal, you know, we're humans. As much as we love ourselves and consider ourselves advanced, we're just a primate. It's surprising that we've ever produced a car, or a laptop, or a presentation. But things are a mess, and of course, software is no exception. Open source has been hugely successful. The smallest market space surveyed had 93% open source. Most market segments have open source in 100% of code bases, which is nice. But open source is, just like any software, riddled with problems. And if we think about the legal side, 53% of open source today has licensing issues. 81% going to the security side has security problems. It, like other types of software, is a mess. Now, in open source specifically, we're working on making things better. So we are aware across the world that the challenges exist, and we're solving them with processes. And this is where we're looking at taking that potential and optimizing it. One example is that in around 2015, the industry got together to create a way for policies and processes to support things like software bill of materials, to tighten up the open source supply chain, to reduce errors around things like licensing. We've made a lot of progress. And finally, I get to the point, which is that we have built actual standards for managing open source. ISO 5230 is the ISO standard for open source license compliance. ISO DIS 18974 is the beautifully named de facto standard and soon to be ISO standard for open source security assurance. We created these standards very specifically to make open source better, to make that supply chain less of a spaghetti monster, and perhaps to change our visibility from 94% no idea to maybe 93% no idea. Now, when you're building a standard, there's many ways to do it. On a technology standard, you want to be as detailed as possible. On a process standard, you probably want to take the opposite. You want to have a way to use broad strokes that guide a market, rather than telling people specifically every detail. The standards we build for compliance and security are high-level process standards. They are designed to be very simple and to work for all types of companies. That means that they're short. They're about seven pages long and they tell you very broadly what to do. Now, these are open, free standards developed by a user community of the people actually doing things with open source. When I say open and free in the same sentence, it's not like saying free software and open source and opening a can of dogma. I mean, literally, it's open to help edit it, and it's free as in you don't pay anything for it. The standards specifically are designed to work company by company or organization by organization. And they say, have some inbound processes, have internal policy processes and training, and have some outbound processes. I might be oversimplifying it a bit, but they say, check what's coming in, keep track of it, and double check when it's going out to make sure that it's what you thought it was. As Organizations adopt 
these standards across the supply chain, we link up coherency and we reduce the amount of errors and nonsense happening out there. Now, tons of people have adopted, for instance, the ISO standard for license compliance. You can see a swarm of logos from organizations that came to our project and said, list us on your website. Perhaps most relevant for this audience is Eclipse, tiny up there. Eclipse Foundation decided to use the ISO standard for open source license compliance for the whole foundation. So those basic processes apply at the first upstream for every Eclipse project, which is where the supply chain starts, right? Every project should be able to use these standards so that the rest of the supply chain has an easier ride. The speed of adoption around the standards has been very positive. For example, in the last four weeks, we've seen tremendous activity in China with companies like Alibaba Cloud, one of the world's largest cloud providers, or China Mobile, the world's largest mobile company, picking up the ISO standard for license compliance. We've seen LG Electronics announce that they've picked up our de facto and soon to be ISO standard for security assurance. Now these are only companies that actually come to us and we're just a project, right? We, don't, we might create the standards and we release them to the market, but that doesn't mean we actually control them. Remember I said open standards, free to adopt. We only know what's going on when people come and tell us. But the market indicators are really interesting. For instance, in 2021, PwC funded an in-depth study by Bitcom in Germany. And for the companies that they polled, 20% with more than 2,000 employees were already using the ISO standard for open source license compliance. So that's really nice. It means that we know the supply chain is a mess. We know open source software is a mess. We have built ways to optimize around it, and the market is increasingly using them. Now, the companies behind OpenChain, in that the companies on the governing board, are fairly diverse. As you can see, it's a real mixture of companies from around the world. You've got companies like Ericsson, a small startup based in Sweden. You've got companies like Huawei, Panasonic, Microsoft, Google. All of these companies are working together in different market spaces because they have one shared challenge. By the way, subnote, uh, the chair of Open Chain is Jimmy Alberg from Ericsson. So currently Sweden is guiding the open source supply chain. Well done. And, and that's a very big community that Sweden is more or less guiding. The open chain community is actually one of the largest in the world around open source, though it's not particularly visible because what we do is so boring. But we have work groups which do global activities. We have country groups operating in local languages, and special interest groups in areas like telco and automotive that look at that segment and say, is there something special here? Is there something the market needs to use open source better? It's, it's been very heartening. Now the standards can sound, I guess, intimidating. When I used to hear the term standard, I always thought difficult and expensive. Uh, the truth is that with something like OpenChain, we spent a lot of time to make it possible to use them, both standards, easily. And that's why organizations like Eclipse, not a for-profit organization, not a multinational, can pick up these standards and actually use them. Self-certification, independent assessment, and third-party certification is available. And something like self-certification, well, it's a checklist. People get a checklist and they can use it to quickly see if they, whatever they is, have what we know are the process points 
required for quality compliance or quality security. If they're missing something, they know where to focus. If they've got everything, they know they meet the standards, and they can announce it if they feel like it. Now, to back up stuff like this, I, I, I mean, it, it, you probably can't read this checklist, but let's take the, the top one. We have a policy governing the open source license compliance of supplied software. So this is from ISO 5230, the ISO standard for license compliance. This is the self-certification. It's saying you have a policy. If you look at that and you think, I don't have a policy and I have no idea how to write one, that's where we spend a lot of time helping people. As well as building the standards, we build tons of reference material. These online training courses are an example. I'm putting them up because they became surprisingly popular. Companies like Continental, Bosch, KPMG are using these for their engineers. But we also have policy templates and other documents, checklists, Kanban, we've got flowcharts, all the kind of things that middle management love are available to help people use these standards. And even the smallest project in the world can go and look at our reference library of over a thousand documents, take whatever they want as CC0, effectively public domain, and go get ready to use the standards. These training courses, by the way, on this slide, are hosted by Linux Foundation. They're free to take, but I've also chucked the assets into our GitHub under CC0. So you can just take them and integrate them into your uh, internal systems or whatever. I don't care. Off you go. Now, I do hope that you can tell people about the fact that these standards exist and that they can be available to support anyone around the world. I hope that you tell them because, just like I said at the beginning of this talk, there's a lot of challenges out there. And I talked optimistically about a supply chain where organization to organization we link things up. We are a long way from that. And while something like Eclipse Foundation is using open chain everywhere, and license compliance, and while a company like LG Electronics is using open chain on security assurance, and while many, many, many people are doing many things, most people are not. Our spaghetti monster has lost a couple of pieces of spaghetti, but it's still a spaghetti monster. There's a lot more to do. Now, I, I did say, that we're one of the biggest communities that no one knows about because this stuff is crushingly boring. And that's true. I mean, it's, it's interesting they gave me the keynote here to open the day because it's almost a certain way to put you into a coma. But, but, going back to how I started this, we have talked a big game in open source. We've talked about changing society. We've talked about making things better. We've talked about how technology is taking humanity forward. And most of what we've said is hot air. Mostly, what open source has done is enabled platforms and technologies that have made some products and services better. We have better televisions. We have, I mean, debatably, better social networks debatably. And we've got some incredible things like a drone on Mars powered by a Qualcomm chipset and Linux. That's all cool. But mostly, the potential of technology, this immense potential of technology, and the immense potential of open source allowing free access to technology has not been realized. And the point of standards like this is to increase the effectiveness of our realization, to take more of the potential and to implement it. And we certainly have a lot to do there. By the way, that guy's the sound guy. He's awesome. He was, he's a musician, too, and he was telling me which microphones to use. Anyway, digression. Back to point. We 
have something incredible in open source. When I started in technology, I'm looking at this room, unfortunately, there are people older than me, but mostly I'm in the, the higher point. When I started in technology, it was very hard to get access to hardware. It was very hard to get access to software. I remember getting an IDE and running it on DOS 3, and I couldn't get the compiler. I didn't have the money to buy the compiler in addition. Something like open source has changed all of that. Uh, and and that's, that's truly wonderful. That's truly wonderful. But let's not kid ourselves. When our main outputs are search engines and social networks and televisions, and our goal was to give everyone in the world the ability to do more with technology, we have to say we haven't done enough. And that's where optimization comes in. That's where getting things like licensing and security, boring as it might seem, helps a great deal because it makes the distance between the potential and actually bringing something into a completed state less. Now, we'll have some time for questions in a minute, but I'll just end with a note that last night um, I was thinking about this talk, and normally I'm not very confrontational in talks. I just I say supply chain, blah, 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 standard, blah, 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 and then I go away. So I was actually quite anxious about this talk. It's been a long time since I've given a talk colored by any politics. Uh, and because of you, <laughs> because I was anxious, I actually dreamt I overslept and missed this talk and didn't get the keynote, and then the organizers were staring at me in an angry way, and so on. Uh, but I didn't. So, you know, unlucky you. But the reason I was anxious is simple. I do, I do like to be contributing to this field. Uh, and I do like all that we've done. But if this was my last talk, I would not be optimistic on what we have accomplished so far. I'd say we've done stunning things. But we could have done a lot more if we didn't waste time arguing or getting distracted or being unrealistic. So I do hope that this event, which has some really interesting people and interesting talks, helps you work out how to turn more potential into reality. And I do hope that when you go away and you continue your day-to-day -day life and contribute to projects or contribute to companies, uh, that you do always think about how you know, technology has potential and open source has potential. But the realization is challenging. And to actually get things done, to optimize them, is a lot of hard work. And it takes things like processes, it takes things like standards, and it takes things like actually deploying them. Not just for your direct benefit, for example, your supply chain to make a car works better and cheaper. But if you feel interested in technology and society, it's also for everyone else's benefit. It means someone you've never heard of in Sudan will access a technology project and maybe build something completely new. And because the project was well maintained, had good processes and documentation, what they built can actually become a viable product or service given their likely budget near zero. The more we have stuff that we could do and didn't do it, the more we're just kicking it down the road for someone else to deal with. Security was a great example of that. We failed completely on security and we're continuing to fail with 81% of code bases having security errors. We've left all of that liability and damage for someone else to deal with. And it could mostly have been avoided if we just double-checked our code and just thought more carefully about how security mattered. We were more obsessed, I suppose, with features and getting solutions to market, or we were more obsessed with the fact that until recently, it wasn't expensive to fail in security. You might get a slap on your wrist, but it wasn't expensive. Anyway, that's changing, and that's good. And 
Uh, you know, in Sweden, for example, we've seen tremendous work by companies improving software processes and security around the world on behalf of everyone else. Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty optimistic about that. Anyway, wrapping up there, uh, what I would like to do is to note that I've worked in the field 17 or 18 years. I've worked on open source copyright, I've worked on open source patents, I've worked on open source standardization. I've negotiated the deals necessary to build the world largest non-aggression agreement over patents for open source. So when I joined OIN as Global Director of Licensing, we had 59 companies agreeing not to have a patent war on Linux. By the time I finished, we had 2,000. Now, there's well over 3,000, including Microsoft, which is nice. When I started building OpenChain, we had an aspiration that maybe we could make the supply chain better. And because enough people agreed, we now have immense data, for instance, that data about the German companies that looks really positive. But in these two decades, it's been very clear there's a lot more to do. And it's been very clear that people my age are not going to do it. We're too old. And uh, we need that next generation to take the fire and to go do things. And even if it looks a little boring to decide, oh, we'll give it a shot. I hope that some of you will do that. The new people who are rising up, uh, the new directors of open source that are appearing, the new project leaders, the new people who are just using technology and sharing it with others and passing on a good message. Thank you very much for your time, and if there's any questions, I'd be very glad to take them. Hi, my name is Joachim. Uh, one question is, how do you, how do you, does your work relate to uh, the work being done in the Cyber Resiliency Act in the EU? And uh, are you talking to them? And, or, yeah. Yeah, good question. So, Open Chain Project is not talking with the drafters of the CRA directly. We're coordinating with organizations like OFE, Open Forum Europe, a think tank in Brussels, on topics like this. The key problem with the Cyber Resiliency Act is that it formulated open source as non-commercial. And something like the open chain community is quite useful to point at, because I'm going back to one of the slides with lots of logos. Give me a moment here. <laughs> yeah. Because when you point at, you know, all of these companies are using this as open source governance standard because they're commercializing on open source. That's useful. Uh, and when you point out these companies are investing in this area on behalf of a giant open source community, that's useful. And we do try to message through organizations like OFE that open source technology is best positioned as a platform technology. So, in other words, open source as an application is not particularly viable in a business market space. There are some models like offering support, but it just doesn't scale. But open source technologies as platforms is enormously viable and does things like fosters that 100 billion euro market that Simon Phipps was citing. And that's a very important point, because the only way open source can be a platform is that if it's available in projects and everyone can contribute to it. Uh, and that inherently suggests that the projects are necessary for businesses to conduct business, and therefore open source is not some non-commercial corner, but rather it's something behind immense innovation. So we do try to contribute. We try to help, but, but, and this is a very important point, 
Uh, we are an organization building international standards in this project. We are not political. And that means that we will contribute to a discussion and say, here's what we see from the market. Here's what we see with our demographics and our standards. But we're not lobbying. We haven't lobbied NTIA in the US. We haven't lobbied uh, the European Commission and so on around the CRA. And we won't. It's not our job. Our job is international standards. I'm pausing here because of the second point, which hasn't been mentioned by anyone, but might come up. You know, people might look at our members and say, aren't some of those organizations lobbying? And I'm sure that's what companies do. That's their job. Uh, and, you know, everyone has different opinions. And I personally think that all opinions are valid. Uh, it's just a question of which opinion is most effective in the market. And on something like CRA, no doubt there's some stakeholders around the world, people talking to the European market that say, you know, maybe framing open source as non-commercial is, is useful for us. And then there's other parties who say, it's not useful for us. And that's fine. That's how markets operate. We're not going to get involved in the details, but we will work with organizations like OFE to share what we've seen, factually. And we'll try to get an outcome that will provide a long-term future for open source. And my take is that framing open source as non-commercial is because someone didn't know enough about how digital innovation works. It doesn't make them a bad person, but it makes them wrong. Already, any other questions? Oh, we got two more. Two more. I'm gonna to change to my cartoon logo. By the way, while we're moving the microphone, this is the result of SOA, LG Electronics second in charge of OSPO. I said to her, I want new mascots, and I got bombarded. <laughs> got hundreds. So um, our standardization project is going to be full of cute cartoons, which is normal for me. I'm from Japan, so. But when I showed this to Mike Dolan, senior VP of Linux Foundation, he was like, oh, God. <laughs> anyway, next question. Hi, I'm Johnny. Uh, one question. You mentioned the US SBOM legislation. How does that how does open chain and the standards fit together with that legislation? It's a really good question. Uh, the short answer is that both of our standards, license compliance and security assurance, say have an SBOM. Neither of our standards say what that SBOM must be. So if you think about our process standards as being way up there, we set the tone, the general direction, the details of the minimum requirements of an SBOM are to be determined by a lower layer. I was on some of the NTIA calls and just sharing factually that, for instance, in the industry it's important to have an SBOM. It's kind of nuts when there isn't an SBOM, and mostly there isn't an SBOM, so there should be an SBOM. I'm a great thinker and very articulate. <laughs> but the, you know, that's what I shared. And uh, am I happy with the NTIA minimum requirements? The answer on my case, personally, is whatever. It just doesn't matter much, as long as we have something, because we're going from zero. Are the NTIA requirements well thought? Pretty much. A lot of really clever people were on those calls, so it's fine. And if you use SPDX or Cyclone because they meet the NTIA requirements, good. You're improving the market. Hi, hi. Uh, my name is Florian, and my question is: You talk about those standards. Are they supposed to be implemented by companies or also by open source communities? Because those may be more decentralized, and it may be harder to comply with those standards. A super good question, and I'm actually trying to find my slide, but I've got hundreds of these cartoons. Hang on. <laughs> I counted my slides today. It was 95. I was like, God. Okay, so 
when I put up this slide, talking about the standards, so talking about our two standards, and I put up this slide, uh, the first example on this slide is company by company. So when we brought these standards to market, quite frankly, we were trying to fix chaos in the corporate sector with the awareness from day one that final upstream is the projects. Okay, so whatever we did would have to work for the projects because eventually we would need the projects to use these. Which is one reason the standards are simple. There's not much difference in terms of resource availability between a very small company and a project in general, unless you're CNCF, which is more like a multinational corporation at this stage. So yeah, we targeted businesses first. But we've always, always been aware that in the end, it's going to be something that has to cross the entire supply chain. And that's why things like our self-certification material uh, tries to make it really clear how you can do this. And ultimately, if a project has any type of entity at all, if it has a we that could be understood as more than the mailing list, it can use these standards. And if it's a project with no structure at all, not always, but mostly it's not relevant to the commercial supply chain. It's going to be something pretty small that isn't going to be super relevant to the market. Not always, I mean, look at OpenSSL, that went well, but mostly. And when we're trying to solve something that involves hundreds of thousands of companies and you know, tens of thousands of projects, we're aiming for what's the largest area we can hit realistically. So yeah, 100% of projects would not be able to adopt these standards. Something which is completely not legally structured would have a challenge. And ultimately would have to find a home that gives it a structure that's we, that could be identified and held responsible for storing information. Uh, but honestly, again, that doesn't matter. I mean, a decentralized project could put a whole bunch of this stuff in place. Like, it could have a policy. Um, it could have some training and onboarding. Would it meet the full ISO standard? Probably not. Does it matter? Probably not. It's improving the baseline. So yeah, my, my lengthy answer is kind of maybe-ish. But we knew what we were doing, okay? We're, we're, trying, we're trying to edge the world in the right direction. Oh. Um, I have a question. Uh, if you think about the evolution of the open source, um, at the beginning, closed open, closed the source. Take example as a traditional bank, and the open source you can take it as an example of credit card. And nowadays we pay by Apple Pay or Face ID. And the, today it's like open source is everywhere. Uh, Ninety percent, let's say, was used in many kind of uh, companies and industries. H what is your view about like say in ten years or fifteen years later, what this will be look like? Since it's already 90% of the open source today, let's say 10 years or 15 years, maybe 99% open source, and all of the open source can be taken as a um, human beings, civilization stuff. I mean, keep it as a, like, move it to the Martians. <laughs> right. <coughs> Apologies, everyone. I had laryngitis a couple of weeks ago. My voice is still shot. Um, <coughs> I'm a political scientist with a specialization in governmental security, a focus on net-centric warfare policy and post-Cold War nuclear weapons policy. I entered open source because I was working on a project regarding the weaponization of open source, to take open source code from the internet and to create tools from it that could not be traced to any nation state. Along the way, I bumped into books like Free Software, Free Society from Stallman. And I thought, that's interesting. 
Not only is this code freely available, but it may be applicable to social good. And I think that happens to a lot of people, that they see that there's a purely utilitarian view of software, and then they realize that it might be something So Mary, to your point, um, I think open source accidentally resonated with a certain aspiration in humans to do more, to do better, to do new things. So I think that open source has encouraged an innovation cycle that's useful. But as a political scientist, I also think open source is nothing special. What has happened is nothing special. It's actually very predictable, if you think about it. The only reason that software was proprietary is based on the economic value. There's more supernormal profit available if you have a temporary monopoly on something people want. For a short while, software was simple enough, new enough, that you could build something, like a simple operating system or a simple office application, and you could charge people terrific amounts of money for it. You could print profit. But very rapidly, because it's an intellectual capital, other people can take and recreate it and make new versions, the profit began to collapse. It began to become a commodity product. And that's exactly why open source, which isn't really software, it's a methodology of managing software, became popular. As complexity increased, profit potential collapsed, the obvious thing was to invest in shared platforms, push down R&D costs, leverage other intellectual capital, and do more. Pure profit motive or trying to change society, it doesn't matter. It was an inevitability. And my prediction, which is funny because you asked this question, uh, I'm giving a speech in December on this. Uh, the speech is entitled The End of Open Source. I've already seen, for instance, large companies with very long histories remove their open source departments. They've folded the open source and software teams, proprietary software teams, into just software. And that's not because open source has lost. It's because open source is now the most effective way of managing software. Plus, we have to manage other ways, like proprietary software. Open source is no longer special, it's just an obvious mechanism, given the economics of this market, to manage software. That means that the type of innovation we've seen here will continue. It will increase. It will continue to change things, but it won't be special or different. It won't be as political. It'll just be the obvious way to try to get value out of complexity and commodities. So I, I think the future will be slightly less exciting than people wanted, but I think the consequence of that future will be more positive than people expected. More open platforms will be available for more people to do more things. But it's not going to be a, a Jetsons future of flying cars and so on. I was going to say it's not going to be a future of robots, but I live in Japan. And we've just replaced all the wheelchairs in the airports with robots. And the last time I ordered food, my uh, waiter was called Rinrin Chan, and she was a robot. The robot thing is true, but the flying cars isn't. So, Mary, uh, yeah, things will change, but not as much as people think. Open innovation will increase and impact society. But it's not as if we're going to shift gears as a species and become magical. Oh, I think the someone at the back question. left. There we go. Looking at the time, I think this is the last question. It was interesting to hear the comment about contactless payments and stuff. When I first went to Japan over 20 years ago, my mobile phone played television and had contactless payments. <laughs> It took a lot of time for the rest of the world to catch up. But Japan has something called Galapagos Syndrome, which we should also be aware of here. Galapagos Syndrome, as referred to in Japan, is where you go and invent something cool that's incompatible with the rest of the world and becomes utterly useless and dies out. 
like our mobile payments from 20 years ago. Uh, so you, you say that it's uh, unpolitical and uh, not in, in how you don't lobby these, the EU, for example, but you just provide data. Um, how do you decide which data to provide? Because mm. that is a political thing in my mind. No, you're right. I mean, obviously I lied. <laughs> I'm a political scientist. <laughs> uh, okay. So, a very good point. And I think the balance we've tried to strike is to find data points that indicate the maximum usually economic value available in this domain versus things that would challenge it. So we've often used economic value as the tipping point. And the filter on that is economic value for the maximum participants, right? Because if you were looking for maximum economic value for a narrow set of participants, you would look at restricting everything. But if you're looking at increasing economic value for as many participants as possible, you're going to get something that mostly seems to do something of benefit to other parties. It's not perfect. And I'm completely aware, and I don't disagree with points that measuring everything by money is not optimal. I personally think that it's a very sad um, situation that so much of our society nowadays is just about how much value do you give in a market space. It's kind of sad. I think the Greek philosophers would not be happy with what we've done. But in the current environment, economic value is an effective enough filter. And that's what we use for as many participants as possible. And that's where one point I'd like to underline as we end up here, as by my little logos. I mean, if you look at who's funding the Open Chain project, I was going to say behind it, but that's not true. We have this enormous swarm of well over a thousand companies behind it and thousands of people. But the companies that actually just contribute money to the project so that they can do things like send me to Sweden are mostly huge multinationals. And looking at that, you'd immediately think, what are they asking for? You know, what's their bias here? Uh, the answer has been since the very beginning that we've been allowed to ask for one thing. It's our project charter, a supply chain that's more trusted and effective. And that's it. So all the other questions of, you know, who gets more or less patent restriction, who gets more ability to negotiate contracts, whatever. That's all off the table. We set the parameters at the beginning. And these companies are not investing in open chain for altruism. It's profitable for them to get a more efficient supply chain. But we're not encumbered by their individual market interests beyond that fact. So we're quite lucky. More efficient supply chain, economic filter, proviso, benefit for the maximum number of parties. So I think that's the last question, so we have time to split into two rooms, but a big thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.